Hi YouTube, my Beastrom has hit 50,000 miles and I wanted to take some time to share my thoughts on whether or not I think you should consider buying a used Beastrom with some higher miles on it. Welcome to Urban Monk TV. So in this episode, I am going to share my experiences and my thoughts on, oh, six plus years of ownership of a first generation V-Strom DL1000 and a um, little bit about me and my channel. If you are new to Urban Monk TV, I'm mainly a city urban uh, adventure writer, let's put it that way. Uh, I live in Southern California, so there's traffic. We do a lot of lane splitting. I ride the bike maybe four days a week on average uh, to commute to work, and that's at least 80 miles each time I take the bike to work round trip. Um, again, I've got 50,000 miles on this bike. So what you'll find on my channel is V-Strom maintenance, uh, changing the sprockets and the chain, um, wiring for some auxiliary lights, uh, valve clearance check, uh, that type of thing. Anytime I come along some routine maintenance that I have to do and I haven't already done a video on the V-Strom, I, I do one, put it up. So you'll find that on my channel and then I also I'm working on a vintage Suzuki Cafe Racer. So if you're interested in that, uh, I am doing a complete frame, down to the frame teardown and restoration and build up. I've rebuilt the top end on the motor and uh, painted the tank and you know we're we're doing that on Urban Monk TV too and you can follow me on Instagram at Urban Monk TV. Um, the V-Strom. My V-Strom is a first generation from 2002 to 2012. Uh, they made the DL1000 pretty much the same bike. Uh, minor tweaks and changes in those uh, in that period of time, that, that decade. But um, as a adventure platform, uh, I think it is very good if your bias is toward the street riding. Uh, it does have some vulnerabilities that I'm sure if you're researching a V-Storm you've probably already discovered when compared to some of the other uh, bikes that are an option out there. Um, one of the pluses, I would say, about this bike is the V-twin engine. A uh, lot of torque down low, uh, low center of gravity, and uh, this engine is really, really reliable. I am uh, one of those guys that has a journal on his bike and takes notes on all the maintenance that he's done. I've got every oil change, all the details of changing tires, mileages, uh, did I do the filter, did I not, uh, oil air filter, throttle body sink, um, ba -ba -ba, changing engine coolant, valve tappet clearance checks, that's a big one, and brakes, um, another valve clearance check, the chain, and the sprockets, it's all here. And uh, first thing I'd like to say about the engine and how I maintain it is the engine oil. I've got, I've got every oil change I've ever done to this bike and I got it with about 2300 miles on it. I didn't know whether or not the original owner had um, changed the oil. I assume they did maybe a 600 mile service oil change, like a break-in oil change, but don't really know when the bike became mine, I just wanted to make sure we started over. So at 2,500 miles, I changed it and I have recorded every single oil change and filter change since. And on average, I'm going to take a look at this and do a little math. On average, I 
let uh, 2,246 miles between each oil change. So, you know, not bad. Some were a little bit longer. All were over 2,000 miles. And uh, so none were over 2,600 miles. So I'm pretty diligent about changing oil. The other thing I'm very di diligent about is what kind of oil I put in here. The only oil I have personally used in this bike since I bought it at 2,300 miles has been uh, Shell Rotella, uh, which is J-A-S-O, Jasso, M-A-2 rated. You need, the manufacturer recommends Jasso M-A-2 rating on your oil. What does that mean? That means I can buy big bulk jugs of inexpensive oil at Walmart and save myself a lot of money by owning a V-Strom. I'm not saying that you can't put in motorcycle oil, but if you have two things on the back, you're good to go. One key is you do not want energy conserving right here, and you want to see J-A-S-O-M-A-2. Another thing I'll say that is a plus about this engine is the compression ratio is such that you do not need to use high octane fuel. This thing runs fine, in fact it runs fantastic on 87 octane uh, using the US R plus M over uh, whatever rating, I forget. 87 octane in the US, if you're somewhere else in the world, figure out the equivalent to that. Um, I've been on a trip uh, we went, oh, I've got a video way down in my history of a trip we did around Lake Superior and we were up in Ontario, in Canada, uh, in some small town gas stations and one of the guys with me uh, was riding on a Triumph uh, 1200 Explorer Tiger and he needed the uh, high octane fuel and they didn't have they had like that mid-grade stuff, but not the 91 or better that that bike recommended. I didn't have any problem. I was putting in the lowest grade stuff they had. Bike ran great. As a commuter and living in California where gas prices are quite high, I had saved myself a lot of money in that price differential over 50,000 miles, uh, you know, between the lower octane fuel and the high octane fuel. That, that added up, you know, I could probably put the money elsewhere, like tires or chains and other wear items. Another area that you can judge the health of an engine is valve clearances. As that wears, you can get some gauge of, you know, are you approaching the end of the life of this engine? Uh, you know, end of life meaning you've got to a point where you need to rebuild it. Um, and because I've done all of my own maintenance and I have my records, um, one great way to look at that is the valve clearances. So I've done, uh, the valve clearance check is every 15,000 miles on uh, the V-Strom, which is good. That's a high number. You don't do it that often. Um, if I were to buy a used V-Strom, I would be, if <laughs> one, I'd ask if they're keeping good records of when they did it. And if they can't produce that, the seller, uh, I would at least quiz them and see if you trust their uh, response to the question uh, and hopefully they've said that they have done it. But um, So three times I've done this and measured those clearances compared with the uh, service spec and here's what I can tell you is there was one exhaust left in the front front cylinder head that uh, wore just one, one size step down and I replaced it. And since then it has completely settled in and um, I haven't had to do any changes here. So what does that mean? Well that means over 50,000 miles I've only replaced one shim in this bike and it is still within spec. So the three times I've gone in there, for the most part, I've just inspected and done nothing. The wear has not occurred, uh, except in that one. But the one 
changed it one time and now it has settled in and doesn't seem to be wearing anymore. Um, when you look at all of the available shim sizes, so as your uh, valves you know, wear up into the seat a little bit more, you need to shorten and shorten or, or make the thickness of those shims thinner and thinner to maintain the correct gap. And when you run out of available shims, well, then there's a point at which you should rebuild the engine. So a measure of the life of the engine is how close are you to the last available shim size? I am nowhere near. I mean, given the shim sizes that are available, I think they go down to 2.5, maybe 2.6 at least. Um, could be lower. I don't even remember off the top of my head, but I know I've looked at it. And at this rate, I'm going to get over 300,000 miles on this engine before I need to, uh, you know, before I run out of available shim sizes. So whether or not other parts of the engine will last that long, you know, of course that's debatable. But from the perspective of valve clearance, it's amazing. Another thing that I've read about the DL1000 engine, and I believe it is the same for the DL650. By the way, a lot of what I'm saying here will apply to the 650. Um, other than you probably get better gas mileage with a 650 and uh, you'll probably pay a little bit lower insurance on a 650 but I don't think the Delta is too much. Anyways, back to the engine. They treat, they being Suzuki, when they manufacture these engines these cylinders are lined with something called Nicosil and um, Nicosil lined cylinders uh, last a very long time, typically. And, uh, but another way to judge whether an engine is healthy or not is to test the compression because an engine essentially is a pump. It's an air pump and you try to pump as much air through it as you can with some fuel and you ignite it along the way and you get a bunch of torque and energy out of it and heat. Um, but let's go ahead and see what kind of compression I have after 50,000 miles and compare it to the uh, spec in the service manual. to do it full. <sighs> the fact that I have to reach in here with a needle nose pliers to get the spark plug out is not a fault of the B-Strom. It is a fault of the uh, crappy insert I have in my spark plug wrench that doesn't hold. The recommended service interval on spark plugs is 7,500 miles um, but uh, I didn't do these. Well, I put this in at 36,500, something like that, and I'm at 50,000 now. So I went well beyond that service interval, and you know, it, it's still fine. I could keep running these plugs, but I'm in here. I'm going to change them. But just a side note: maybe you don't have to follow. If you buy a V-Strom, don't follow that one so closely. One caveat with the compression test I'm going to do here is I did not have the opportunity to warm the engine up before I did. Um, long story, but we're going to be testing a cold engine here. So more than likely we will have a little bit lower reading than is actual. Here's the rear. And here goes the front. So 
standard is 142 to 199 PSI. Um, I'm at like 160, 170-ish, so squarely in a very good place in the uh, compression range. Uh, limit is as low as 114, well I'm miles above that. And the difference between the two cylinders can be 28 PSI. Well, I'm within like 10-ish, so fine. Everything looks great from a compression standpoint. So I got a really solid engine there with many more miles left in it if I take care of it um, with you know 50,000 miles on it already. So you've gone to your local dealership and they have a first generation V-Strom for sale, a little bit higher miles, you know, 30, 40, maybe 50,000, and you're wondering, gosh, the price is great, and they usually are. Um, but is this a good buy? Uh, I mentioned that I uh, commute a lot, uh, I work, so a lot of these miles are commuting in Los Angeles traffic, splitting lanes, in tight between cars. Um, why is this bike fantastic for that? Excellent brakes, uh, the rideability is fantastic, it's got a low center of gravity, you can respond quickly. Um, I personally think that the V-Strom 1000 is less dirt bike and more sport bike, but it's sitting higher. And uh, that sport bike sitting higher, that's where it really shines in city traffic. But also, when you're sitting higher, you've got that 1000 cc's, about 94, 95 horsepower, good torque because it's a V-twin and this thing will eat up the miles. Uh, recently took a trip up to the Monterey Peninsula and back 750 miles riding with a friend who was on a, a BMW GS 1200, uh, which is the benchmark for adventure touring bikes, and he will tell you that he, you know, he had trouble keeping up with me, and um, this thing holds its own against those big adventure bikes, no problem. And I've also been out, uh, like I said, with a friend riding on the 1200 Triumph Tiger Explorer and again, you know, is he this much faster? Yes, he's got a, like a race engine in that 1200 and he's got some displacement on me, but we're talking about speeds that we shouldn't have been riding anyway, so at some point you just let him go be a crazy idiot and I'm still flying. So. Point is, 1,000 cc's, you get, you get a lot of power, you get a lot of engine in, for a low cost compared to those other bikes. Another place I think the V-Strom 1000 shines is you get that 1,000 liter bike power, uh, but you don't pay the insurance rates that you would for a sporty liter bike. You go into a 1,000 cc sport bike category as far as your insurance underwriter goes and you better get your wallet out. Here, they're much, much more gentle on you on the insurance area. So another big savings, but you still have plenty of power and you can still go fast if you like to go fast. Another thing I'll say about the longevity of this engine, which is a long proven history out there, but uh, these first gen ones, especially the 2012, I, I don't know if they all do, but many of the first generation have the oil cooler down at below. So you're not only getting good water cooling, but you're also cooling the oil. And uh, a cooler engine that isn't running at high, high temperatures is a happy engine that uh, should run longer. I feel more assured that I have that oil cooler there. But is it a weakness? Mm, yes, in certain situations. If you're a serious off-roader, you're going to be going that direction, and things are going to be flying up off of here and hitting into here. And that's where maybe the V-Strom is not uh, the strongest competitor out there in adventure touring. So you really have to just ask yourself, what kind of riding am I doing mostly? If you're mostly riding on the street, like I am, 
and uh, but you want to get out into the canyon roads and you find a gravel road or you're you know, in just a more remote place and uh, you don't want to be stopping you do want to go down that gravel road or that fire road and explore the V-Strom can do it uh, especially with the um, with you know the right tires on it um, just it's not going to do the serious serious off-road stuff with big rocks um, you know it's 80% street 20% off-road uh, but it is off-road capable they've done a good job of keeping the seat and tank narrow where your legs are and uh, I'm comfortable standing up on this thing so you know for off-road it's very comfortable very maneuverable low center of gravity it just has that Achilles heel on the front side of the engine and you could do some things about that there are you know guards for putting underneath the crankcase that uh, are pretty robust out there so there are options the first generation DL 1000's come in array of colors there's red blue yellow silver even burgundy and good luck keeping me clean parts are relatively inexpensive I got these Givi crash bars for I think hundred and fifty dollars and uh, I did drop the bike once just doing something stupid at low speeds and uh, you know it saved all my plastics and did its job exactly as it's supposed to so I was happy I had them if you're lucky enough to find one of the adventure models like I did, it comes with some eh, cases that work. They work in that they're easy to hook up. They hold a lot of stuff, um, hang pretty low, so I, I would say as far as center of gravity goes, they're, they're decent. Um, but they're, they're built not by Suzuki, but by uh, another manufacturer and I did have a lot of problems with these uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about them but uh, the little cables inside when you open the door up they just broke right away so the door swings all the way open and everything falls out if you're not paying attention and up here on the top case I had a recurring problem that I dumped money into on the Adventure Series top case, I've had a lot of trouble with these reflectors on the back. Um, there's two screws, quite small, holding these down here and here from underneath. There and there. And they crack. And they've broken off. And I've lost this one more than once, uh, and the other one a, a single time. So these cases are not something that you can continue to buy through Suzuki. I don't know why these reflectors are nearly impossible to find, but I had to buy an entire case off of eBay that was in pretty rough shape, and you can see this one has still got a bunch of tape residue on it, just to get this one, and then this thing broke again, and now I've got it glued on there, and it doesn't quite sit all the way down. Um, you know, the cases they work. I, if you're buying a used V-Strom, I guess I would recommend, if they come with it, fine, use them. Uh, in my case, I did that. If they don't, then you're probably better off just getting something aftermarket that uh, is built a little bit better. Another thing I love about the V-Strom is the wheel and tire size. Uh, these are sized the same as the BMW 1200 GS. So, there's a lot of tire options available for you. Anything that'll fit the 1200 GS or the 1150 GS will fit the V-Strom. So, you know, you're going to find tires, you're going to find options, and you can get exactly what you want. If you're really a street rider, you can put street bias tires on, and um, you'll get some incredible performance out of this thing. Let's not forget, this engine came from a race bike, the TL1000 originally, that was um, really kind of Suzuki's answer to the Ducati Panigale. So, um, it's got the spirit of a race bike. And on tires, I will say, 
Uh, if you've watched my channel before, you know I'm a fan of the Shinko 705s for this bike. Um, price is fantastic. These tires are half the cost of just about everything else out there. Um, I buy them online, have them shipped to my house, and I mount them myself and balance them myself. I save a lot of money that way. Uh, of course, you can always just have someone else do it. You're still saving. The tires cost what they cost. And watch my reviews on those tires to see what kind of mileage I get out of them. But I regularly get 10,000 out of a rear, and I've gotten uh, over 30,000 out of a front. So I love the fact that that good performing, inexpensive, uh, long lasting tire is available to fit on this bike or that this bike fits those tires. I don't know, however you want to look at it. It's a win for me in my wallet. Are there any problems with the V-Strom? Well, maybe one thing, uh, well, let's say one thing. From the factory, many, if not all, of these first-gen V-Stroms, um, I don't know if EPA emissions drove this decision or what, but the fuel mapping, meaning how much fuel the computer is giving the engine during uh, certain places in the rev range, uh, fuel mapping is way too lean from maybe 2600 RPMs to 3300 RPMs. There's this range in there, and by the way, it's where I tend to be uh, the entire time I'm at a comfortable pace when I'm lane splitting. So lane splitting, I don't want to fool around. I want everything running really good there. Uh, good brakes, good fueling, good control. Uh, because I need to make some pretty quick decisions sometimes when I'm lane splitting. Anyways, runs too lean in that range and uh, you know hesitates and backfires. And um, I think there's two, if you do your research, there's two solutions to that. One is a recall and you get a new computer from Suzuki. I've read that guys uh, have found that that solves the problem for them. I've also read that some guys did that and, you know, it was a little better but not entirely solved. I don't know. I didn't take that route. What I did was put a little bit of money into a power commander. So with the power commander, this bike runs fantastic. With the power commander, you've got a couple options. Uh, it's about... $375 to $400 for the one that fits this bike. Um, you can either get a map, which is a program that says, you know, you're giving it this much fuel here and this much fuel here and all the way through different throttle positions. Um, you can go get a map offline, download them, go to Strong Troopers and get them, or you can take your bike to someone who uh, has a dyno and mounts the bike on the dyno puts the power commander on and then tunes that power commander to your bike and uh, goes through the entire RPM range in all the different gears. And in that route, you can actually dial in spots where you're, you're really, you can just get a really custom map, let's put it that way. And each bike's a little different. So when you're getting a generic map online, you know, you know maybe that worked for one guy's bike and it's not exactly perfect for yours. Um, I ended up spending $700, uh, full disclosure, on the Power Commander and having, the, uh, having it dynoed and mapped specifically for my bike. But now, anywhere in the rev range, I am just silky smooth all the way. And essentially what we did was put a little bit more fuel into that 2600 to 3300 RPM range. Uh, but then I also tend to travel at about 75, and I know the RPM range that the bike's at in six gear, and I have them just lean that out just a little bit in that spot to help my fuel economy. Um, and it, it just, I've been so thrilled with the Power Commander ever since I put it on this bike. But it, it was an expense. But let's talk about where I have not had expense in the entire time I've owned this bike. That is the original battery. I've never once changed the battery. Now it's six years old and 50,000 miles. I'm actually thinking about changing it just because uh, eventually it's got to let me down. But uh, no money spent there so far. The clutch 
Still original clutch. Have not had to do anything. Not even sure what the clearances are. I've not had to pull it apart and measure the plates. But um, when it starts slipping, well, I'll throw a video up and let you guys know. Be sure to subscribe and follow. Uh, you, then you'll know when uh, I finally hit that point. I did have a little trouble here on, I guess, what I'll call the dashboard on the top of the cowl uh, or cowling. Um, but this is not a Suzuki problem, I don't believe. Uh, the sun gets pretty intense here in Southern California and I have this taller aftermarket windscreen on here. That's a C. Bailey um, and it doesn't have you know any shielding down here and essentially it acted like a big magnifying glass and it intensified the sunlight here to the point where it melted these plastics. So this isn't a Suzuki V-Strom problem, that is a windscreen problem and where I live problem. So I just wanted to mention it in case you have a similar situation on your hands. Brakes. I have replaced the rear brakes one time and the front brakes one time in 50,000 miles. Uh, when was that? I did the rear pads at 21,500-ish, and when did I do the front brakes? Well, it says I changed the brake fluid on the front at 24,200 miles. The pads were still okay, so I left them in. Uh, changed clutch fluid at 24,200, did the brake fluid. Did I just miss? I missed the front brakes. Well, all right. So I don't know when I did them, but I know I did them, and it was after the rears by months. So, anyways, um, the brake pads for this bike are inexpensive. I buy them off eBay, and uh, I get the Six Sixity brand, uh, whatever, centered pads. Um, not a lot of money. Again, this thing is just—it's low cost to acquire and it is low cost to own but it performs and it gets you done and it will get you there and it will eat up the miles. These first generation V-Stroms do not come with anti-lock brakes and um, at least not in the 1000 and you know I've been riding motorcycles since I was 12 years old so that puts me at 37 years of motorcycle riding I'm okay with that. If you uh, feel that your skills are at a level where ABS uh, just really isn't going to do a whole lot for you, then don't hesitate to look at a V-Strom. If you're maybe a little bit newer rider and really want ABS and feel like uh, you want that safety net, uh, no shame in it, and maybe then consider one of the newer generation V-Stroms because it still has everything that was great about this bike including that engine. But I don't think they have the oil cooler anymore. The front suspension is preload adjustable and only preload adjustable. Rear suspension is preload adjustable and yeah, there is some adjustment for damping. I have changed the chain and front and rear sprockets uh, one time. Uh, then I changed the front sprocket a second time and the chain because I chose the wrong chain uh, and I've got a, a video on that the uh, Western Power Sports chain just did not hold up on this bike even though the specs uh, really were in alignment with I've got a bike master chain on it now and that's holding up fantastic inexpensive um, so I would recommend that but uh, if you bought one of these with high miles on it, you may want to consider at least changing the front sprocket, but frankly, when I changed the rear, it was still in very good shape. So I would not be afraid of uh, a high mileage bike in that regard, uh, but you may have to throw a little money at that. Front sprockets are like $16. It's nothing. And they're easy to do. I got a video on it. Just follow those steps. In conclusion, should you buy that lower priced, higher mile V-Strom that fits your budget um, if you are 
mainly a street rider, but you like to get out and have some adventures, and you like to conquer a lot of miles and, and eat them up with ease, uh, my recommendation would be yes. Um, so much so that at 50,000 miles, I'm the kind of person with uh, the finances to go buy a new bike now and trade this thing in, but I'm not going to. I will ride this bike anywhere right now and uh, trust that I'm going to get there. Um, and I'm going to get there comfortably. I'm going to get there inexpensively. If I'm riding with other riders on bigger displacement bikes or bigger brand names, you know, not that Suzuki isn't a big brand name, but you know what bikes I'm talking about. They're going to have a hard time keeping up with me, to be frank. Um, some of that is my riding skill level. But, uh, you know, it'll do it. And even if they're fantastic riders, um, you'll be right there in the pack with them the whole time. Don't worry about that. You will be burning up so much less money as you're having fun doing that. Um, you will have burned up so much less money acquiring it in the first place. So the savings between this and some other used option out there, um, that savings can go into some of the parts that you know you do need to do. There are brakes, there are chains, there are sprockets, um, things like that, you know, fluids. You gotta change those. But that's all I've done on this bike. Oh, and the power commander. That may be the only Achilles heel to this thing, but just accept it up front. Go ahead and look at the price of that used V-Strom with 30, 40, maybe even 50,000 miles on it, and then just throw on 400 to $700 in your mind and compare that with what those other bikes are used with the same mileage. I've had 50,000 miles of motorcycling bliss on this thing and I couldn't be happier. So my recommendation is go ahead and buy that used high mileage V-Strom with confidence. Hey, if you like what I'm doing here and you own a V-Strom or you're now going to own a V-Strom, um, subscribe to my channel and if you like this video, click the thumbs up. Um, there's a little bell if you want notifications when I put something else up. And again, I work on that 1978 Suzuki GS Cafe Racer project. You can learn a lot about rebuilding and restoring a vintage motorcycle there. Uh, and I just appreciate you watching. Thanks.